again, but we were going to just kind of casually talk about today, Mike, a subject that I am so just all, I, I, you guys like, you guys know I love history and Mike, I tell my, I tell my audience all the time that the reason why I love history, because history ain't nothing but gossip. Like that's all it is. That's it's all gossip. it is. Yeah. Gossip. Right. And I am so upset that nobody ever told me that in the 1970s in New York City, legitimately guys, they had what they called the witch wars. And when I say, like, when we talk about the witch wars, Mike, we're not talking about some, like, shadowy, like, high, we're talking about, like, human beings that were in the occult that were running around literally putting spells on each other. Yes, and different kinds of witches that believe different things, arguing about that, what's the, what's the right kind of witchcraft, and, you know, it, it right, dead names. In the book, he talks about it, I was like, I was... When I was reading that section, Mike, I was, this was months ago. I, I think I was texting you. I was sitting in the hair salon in the small town in Florida with this book. And I was like, like reading this and I was like, oh, this is, y'all got to see this. I was like, this is, but it's so interesting because he gets the writer of this book, which for, I know we've done a show on this before, but do, do we want to give a big, uh, you're the one that introduced me to this book. Do we want to give a, just a brief uh, background of what this Yeah, book what, you're, what you're holding there is the book Dead Names uh, written by a pseudonym, okay, uh, the name of Simon. Uh, that's been suspected to be author Peter Lavenda. I can't confirm or deny that. Okay, uh, he actually has denied it, but there's a lot of evidence it might be him. Um, regardless, um, basically, it's a book about people or uh, the in the occult scene in New York City in the late '60s into the 1970s. Uh, it also has to do with. Um, uh, churches being fronts and uh how people started churches to get out of going to vietnam and all that um and also it ties in a little bit with the son of sam case which is yeah. why i read that book and a big part of the book also has to do with the uh the necronomicon yes how how it was translated by this simon character okay and there were uh a lot of action was based around two occult bookstores mm -hmm. uh one called the warlock shop in brooklyn and that eventually became the magical child in manhattan it was the same owner guy's name was slater yeah yeah and that's and that's what's so so what's in this i mean guys this book again i will put a link to it and i've i had previously covered the necronomicon on my channel um when i was going through grimoires and um you know there's a lot of legend around the necronomicon some people think it's totally a farce and it's just like folklore and it's just something yeah. that was created out of nothing but this kind of proves and in my opinion nothing is created out, uh, there's nothing that's created from nothing like everything comes from somewhere and yeah. uh, and i totally know that this is a legitimate you know there might be spin-offs and there might be you know forgeries out there but this the liter and what's so interesting it's almost like at, when we're building up to the, the Necronomicon, which is when he talks about the witch wars, is, yeah, we've got this situation, um, which it's, it's it very much like we're in today. Because my dad did two tours in Vietnam, saw some, yeah. I, you know, um, but he was there when I was born, as a matter of fact. But, um, you know, it, it, it's when you had these these uh, college deferments, it created a... a uh, an animosity between people okay it's like oh i got drafted or oh, you're in college you can get away with it it wasn't fair okay so what they're doing now i imagine they i don't know what they would what kind of deferments they would give people to get out of it other than medical ones which always happen but yeah but you know and that's kind of the energy of this book is how it starts they they put these rules in place yeah. okay if you if you were in school you could get out of it. Well, guess what? Every college got inundated with applications. Right. Okay. And I mean, I don't blame somebody for using the system to get out of it. Yeah. It's um so it's so with that being said, if you guys at the beginning of this book, you know, we've got these these guys that this book kind of follows at the beginning where they are young white guys like they're about to graduate high school and they've got this impending doom because they know they're going to be drafted and so you know uh, they have this issue about how to get out of the draft and you can go to college or whatever but they end up becoming like priests right just because if you go into yeah. the class, you don't have to be drafted 
Yeah, they interestingly, I, I like you said earlier, I got into this book because of the Son of Sam research I was doing. And these two guys graduated from the same high school as David Berkowitz, the Son of Sam, okay? Uh, Columbus High School in the Bronx. And yeah, I mean, in 19, late 60s, uh, 68 or so, I think is what the year they're talking about because it, it happens, I think, the same year. I think they graduate the same year that RFK was... Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're talking like 68. Berkowitz actually graduated like, I think, 70 or 71. So he was a little bit behind these guys. But the war was still on at that point. And he, he, actually, mm -hmm. uh, he actually joined the Army enlisted. Yeah, he, yeah. He wanted to go to Vietnam. See, he, you know, he wanted to go there, but he didn't get sent there. He got sent to Korea instead. Okay, which was a disappointment for him at that time. I don't need to go into the whole Son of Sam case, but that's that's why I got interested in this book. And it really turned into a whole eye opening experience as to what the climate was like, you know, this underground occult uh, influenced uh you know world going on in in brooklyn and in the bronx uh one important thing in the book too is that it it establishes that david berkowitz met the car brothers in the eastern part of the bronx which when we were doing the research this was something that we wanted to bring out that they didn't meet in yonkers it was it was actually earlier in the eastern part of the bronx all the way across town and uh, then he eventually moved there to be closer to these Carr brothers. Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah. that was our basis of that. But then there's just the book turned out to be so much more. And what I liked about the book is it wasn't written by Maury Terry. No. Who is who, you know, who is the, you know, the, the uh, he wrote The Ultimate Evil and he brought all this, this conspiracy to the attention of the world related to the Son of Sam case. Uh, it's actually now another author talking about these same people. So it's interesting. Um, so this also, uh, you know, he, I'm trying to look at where I marked you guys, but he, so one thing that got me too is something, because I go through a lot of missing manuscripts and missing books of the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And what was interesting, so the what, the, the guy, who, Peter Lavenda, because that's one of the guys they follow who they think people think. Yeah, they mentioned Peter in the book. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's and he's really smart. Like he's like kind of a savant when it comes to, especially like under, cause a lot of occultism is very ancient and it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of teaching to understand what it is they're actually saying. And especially old occult or more esoteric, which esoteric is more hidden occult. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so I respect this guy's intelligence, but he basically, They've, they've kind of gotten themselves into this priesthood because they're trying to draw dodge the draft, right? And they end up uncovering this manuscript they, with all these different churches, which are like fronts for different... They kind of, which is, that's fascinating. So there's all these different rabbit holes you can go down with. Yeah. This. You can read this book like 20 times and pick up even new information. But they find that... They, so they, that's what's so impressive is that these two young kids, these two young kids... I mean, I think about 18 year olds now, and I don't, I don't think an 18 year old now could do this, but they literally like discover kind of this treasure trove of information that's kind of being through these kind of front groups. And that's a whole thing too in itself, like what was happening. And do you, do you have much information on that, Mike, about like what was happening with these old manuscripts that were kind of being uh, like underground, black marketed? Yeah, there was a, there's a whole like, industry a black market industry with with stealing books yeah okay stealing stealing you know original manuscripts and things like that that have value okay yeah. there's a whole underground black market with that especially at that time okay um and it's mentioned in the book that uh you know they they these guys knew people that were in this underground world and stealing manuscripts, making money like that. People would be looking for certain books, uh, occult books. In mm -hmm. fact, when, you know, the book, the Dead Names is a lot about the Necronomicon and how that was found, okay, it was stolen in a, from a library, okay, and not a public library. I think it was a personal, yeah. personal library. And um, Herman Slater, who had the Warlock shop, Okay, so probably around 19, 
73 70 74 something like that okay in brooklyn in brooklyn heights area um when he's brought this copy of the necronomicon he his mouth drops open he's like what okay yeah, it, was like always, it, it, it was always believed that the first the first real mention of the necronomicon is by hp lovecraft yeah. in the in the early 1900s in his book okay i forget the is it is it called the necronomicon i forget the name of the oh, story. I, I vaguely remember i knew lovecraft yeah. he was a weird guy in himself like talk about oh, yeah. signs that this guy grew up in like an establishment home like there were signs yeah. there. And he writes about it and i think that's kind of where and guys i'll place those videos those old videos i did down in the description box below but there's it's almost like people had a hard time accepting that this book was real because lovecraft created this like fantasy world right. in, in his books and so people kind of i think assumed that his mentioning of the ne necronomicon was not it was more fantasy in that and not real it's just something that he designed in his yeah. head okay and, and put it out in his books but uh so when Slater saw this, he's like, "This, this, this is real." And he's like, "This can't be real." But as they started trying to decipher it, because it's written in like an ancient language, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, it turned out like th this can't be fake because of the way the language is and all. There's no way somebody could have totally faked this, right? Right. Okay? And there's even some of it I think could not be translated. There was some stuff that was left out. As, as being able to translate it um i think it's you know it's something you don't want to mess around with <laughs> no i that uh, you know you there are people who have experience when i was first researching the necronomicon there were i would look at other people's experiences with it and so many people have had even just copies of it have had weird things happen um i listened to a a very old recording of allegedly simon um talking about the necronomicon and he he gives warnings like this is not and that's one thing i do respect about the writer of this book um he you know when you're dealing with the world of magic and anybody who is religious or spiritual you i mean that prayer is mag magic is all around us we know that this is there's more to this than we've been taught but one thing i really respect about the writer of this book is that he makes it very clear that there's a line between good and bad or bl black and white magic and there's even a scene in the book where i think it was like peter lavenda or him or somebody was asked i can't remember who by a person to help them come conjure demons and he was like you know no not yeah. happening well, i'm not doing this yeah 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 and so you're you have to have integrity when you mess with this stuff oh serendipitous and just bizarre this story because it's like none of this would have been revealed if these two boys didn't try to drop uh, dodge the draft yeah i guess that would kind of be the the you know the impetus of what they were were doing is is originally they just wanted to get out of the draft but yeah. also they, they were interested in the occult yeah. okay so already. you Especially know Le Lavenda, lavenda's always been interested in this since a, as a kid mm -hmm. okay he was interested in that and uh i forget the other guy's name uh andrew pratsky yeah uh, andrew pratsky okay uh so they start this you know they decide we're gonna we're going to start a church of our own to get and because you can get a deferment a religious deferment okay priests didn't go to vietnam all right right but they weren't going to join the seminary they didn't want to be catholic they didn't want the rules with that uh they wanted something more orthodox okay and they both it, had eastern also, European also background, like, right what's that they both had eastern european lineage or heritage is that correct well yeah they had it right both of them had a you know an eastern european background czechoslovakian or some something like that I, I forget um but um uh it it basically what they were trying to do is get use this church as a front okay not just to get out of vietnam but as a front for their occult practices okay pratsky's father actually built a church for yeah. them in the bronx okay and uh you know pratsky supposedly uh uh it uh he introduced david berkowitz to the to michael carr and then michael Carr to john carr okay so there's a connection there with the son of sam that you know the, already you had him 
interested in the occult, Barkowitz, okay? And occultism and, is all over the Son of Sand Cave. Yeah, all yeah. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's all over it. And, and one thing, too, that... Um, you know, you mentioned about respecting magic and stuff is 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 like Berkowitz has a story where he said that he saw somebody conjure up a demon. Oh, time. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. And, you know, so he he got deep into this stuff. And uh, uh, and of course, we've discussed on our shows, you know, what the letters meant and and what uh, the symbology of Son of Sam could mean. You know, there's a lot of theories out there with it. Um, you know, it's something that, uh, th th this occult stuff is something that shouldn't be played with, obviously. No, no. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like the whole saying, you know, shame, you don't believe in the devil because the devil believes in you. You know, if you don't right. understand something, there's a really funny TikTok out there where this like young white girl, like she's sitting in her car. She's like, look what I found in the woods. And she pulls up something that's like dirty. And then this black Haitian woman comes on and she's like, put it back put it back like you know like don't don't jumanji us anymore and it's just that you, you have to respect that there are forces in this world in the ether that are beyond our almost beyond our control and if we get if we get too in, intertwined with those forces it's not going to work out for us and i know that um in my own studies with like the law of one with light in the dark you know, a lot of times when we experience like paranormal phenomenon, which is, a, you know, it can be associated with the occult. It's never it's most of the time unless it's like an earthbound spirit that's just not moving on yet. Um, it's not necessarily it's not always good because spirits of the light, like angels, all that kind of stuff. They only intervene. They, they are very respectful of our free will of our right to ask and, and to, to ask for help. And so they right. they will only intervene when you ask them to intervene or when it's necessary absolutely necessary they're not just popping around trying to entice you the, the spirits that are popping around trying to entice you are always dark dark spirits and sometimes they mimic the light and um and so you have to have discernment and if you're me you're messing with magic you know especially when we look at the darker occult um the devil's going to give you what you want for a price. And I think yeah. people get obsessed with that because they're all of a sudden things are starting to happen for them positively in their life. Like they're getting better jobs. They're getting more money. They're getting the relationship they want. And so they keep getting deeper into it because they think that, you know, there's a selfish desire, but eventually the devil comes to collect his pay. You right. know, that's the destruction and the chaos, you know, these, these, um, Darker entities feed off of loosh, which is energetic fear from us. And so they put us in a, a state of fear in order to create a kinetic, like energetic, um, basically buffet for, for these dark spirits to come in and create even more havoc and chaos. And, um, and so it's, I, I really do like when that, but I really have a lot of respect for whoever wrote this book because he does make that he's pretty integral about like, you don't want to, you know, it's, there's a difference between putting a little, I mean, I have protection salt here. It's a difference between putting a little salt at your front door to make sure your family is safe and going into a basement doing it and becoming a demon, you know? Yeah, it's, that's yeah. a totally different thing. Totally different. And it's your, you, and so, um, and so with the Necronomicon, we know the Necronomicon too has the title of being like the most vicious grimoire, like the, the, the deadliest, scariest grimoire out there. Yes. And, um, and he gets into the back of it. He kind of gets into what he translated. He talks a lot about the Sumerian gods. And so basically with the witch wars, but in this book, he goes through all the different lineages of magic, doesn't he? And that's where we get to the witch wars. The witch yeah. going on. So all of this this is like a hot mess express. Like you've got the Vietnam War draft dodging. These boys are became their own little church and their priests. And all of a sudden they found this like sacred manuscript that people thought was fake. And they're trying to translate it. But then you've also got this subculture with occultism where all these different lineages are like battling each other. Right. And in that, in that time too, another form of magic was making its, you know, its first appearance. That is that kind of like, you know wiccan type yeah. thing okay yeah. uh they were th these were the the people that you know wore crystals and these you know believed in that stuff and you know wicked mother earth and all that well that was a whole that was one lineage then you had another lineage of you know crowley type magic mm -hmm. uh you know um all these different things and the, the people were you know believers of it 
and they were kind of all jockeying for for power in a sense in in the occult world at the time there was even one group which i laughed hysterically and i text my boyfriend i can't remember what they were called but they were like basically like a group of people who had been born with like powers and the more you look into that that's like rh negative people like myself so i text my boyfriend i was like well well, <laughs> if I had been in the, born in the 1970s in New York, guess what? I might have been involved in this too. Um, so we've got all these different people trying to like establish a hierarchy of yeah. these different covens. You know, that's just so dramatic. Like, I'm just like, I, I, that's, I'm, too, I'm too tired for that. I'd be like, let's just, it's fine. And, and you know, the, like the, uh, the magical child, I actually was in there a couple of times. Uh, doesn't exist anymore. But, uh, you know, in the front... You had them selling tarot cards and crystals and, you Har know. Harmless, and in the back, it's where yeah, I get In the back room behind the curtain is where everybody was meeting and, and doing these uh, these spells and stuff and, and practicing these, and thing, these things. Uh, at the time of the, it seems to me that at the time of this book, okay, the, the main kind of powers or so main kind of witchcraft was more like the crowley type yeah okay that seemed to be the dominant type the impression i got it's like uh it's almost like a cult yeah okay it can in, become in that way, yeah. that, thank you, you know, so much guys for sitting through this short form interview for the long form interview for the whole hour and a half interview that mike and i do you can find that down under show notes a link to that full interview this interview was so potent with so much information that cannot be shared on YouTube that we had to put it on the other platform. So again, if you go under show notes, you'll see the long form interview, a link to that. So you can listen to the whole hour and a half if you want to. Other than that, all of the links that I discuss in this episode with Mike will also be provided in the description box below. All of the past episodes that I spoke about with the grimoires, a link to Dead Names, the, the translation of the ne Necronomicon will also be linked in the description box below so you can make that purchase for yourself if you want to. Now, once again, if this subject is something that you are interested in, there is a link also in the description box to a panel event that is being hosted on Gnostic TV with a bunch of people who are survivors of the dark occult. This is called Tales from the Dark Side and you can get tickets to that event. Mike will also be participating in that event with his co-host Rob Rossi. Of course, as you know, Mike and Rob Rossi are huge researchers and had a long-running podcast called The Son of Sam Chronicles where they really looked into occultism in the Son of Sam case from New York. And on top of that, as I previously said, we, were all, we will also have a lot of whistleblowers and survivors of people who were born and raised in these dark occult families. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining us for this short form interview. And if you would like to visit the long form interview with everything that was cut out of this interview, the link is under show notes.